Um, so I'm just going to do this and we'll see how it goes. Um, it may be very short, but as I said, it might take not an hour or so. <laughs> uh, uh, about what I tried to have covered last year, what certainly was not covered last year that will get covered this year, even if I have to do it, if somebody else wants to volunteer. Uh, and s just some conceptual points. So, uh, there are at least there are more than this. There are more than five entries, right? If you just start looking around uh, at, on Wikipedia or whatever, you'll find more than five defined entries. But there are five that strike me as particularly central and important to understand, which means to just figure out what in the world they are, each individually, and then what relations there are, and even more importantly, what relations there are not between these different entities. Um, because it has been my experience that in the physics literature, these entities are thrown around and interchanged indiscriminately. And someone would be talking about one kind of entropy and then draw a conclusion which would only be appropriate if it was an entirely different kind of entropy. And not surprisingly, this is not particularly good methodology. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's still a little, I mean, the, there may be a place for Wayne to come up, and he may be dissatisfied with part of this kind of discussion, but let me at least go through the phone. Um, you haven't started already. <laughs> well, you, you'll, I'm, I'm just dancing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there, there is a thermodynamic entropy. This was how the term was originally introduced in doing classical thermodynamics before the acceptance of the atomic theory, before trying to embed this in statistical mechanics or statistical considerations. Uh, the term was introduced and principles about it were given, being the second law. In statistical mechanics, there is a Boltzmann entropy defined by Boltzmann, surprisingly. Um, in statistical mechanics, there is a Gibbs entropy defined by Gibbs, not surprisingly. Uh, both of these, as far as I know, kind of live ambit of statistical mechanics, but they're different, and they're very different in some ways, right? Um, and what the relation between them is, and why there should be two floating around, uh, and whether people get awfully confused about what they are is something. You know, we tried to get somewhat clear on last year, and I want to sum up them some things, but this is where it, it, it may be that we need some more discussion of this. Because yeah, I, I actually thought about the relation between those three at some point. Yeah, good. There is a Shannon entropy, which I gave a talk about last year, and uh, I'll recap a bit uh, in this little presentation, and the relation between it and any of these is not at all obvious that there is any relationship is not at all obvious. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that because I'm suggesting I have the big surprise on my sleeve and I'm going to reveal what the relationship is as far as I know it's uh, And then th this is the one in square brackets because we never got to it last year, the von Neumann entropy, which is peculiar to quantum mechanics because we just didn't get to quantum mechanics. Generally, we're quantum statistical mechanics, which is now piling quantum mechanics on top of statistical considerations. And this is a lacuna I think we really need to address. And I will give, can give, and prepare to give a short talk. I am no expert on this at all, but if somebody feels that they are, have expertise about this, I'm happy to conceive the role of doing a sort of first pass presentation. And so those are the five. If anybody wants to add. I can, I can say something about fun too. OK, good. So I, anyway, that's a topic I think we really need to cover uh, to some extent. Which, uh, and I'll do a little. Uh, I can do a little. OK. Uh, 
Um, so the thermodynamic entropy, the classical thermodynamic entropy, uh, arose in the context of doing classical thermodynamics, which was describing systems using thermodynamic macroscopic quantities, particularly for gases that we know temperature, pressure, and volume, the idea of gas uh, And in that context, the definition of entropy uh, is given in terms of something called reversible processes. So you have to kind of understand that there are a available suite of reversible processes that you can apply to systems. And equilibrium states, which just meant states where these macroscopic thermodynamic quantities were stationary, right? I mean, so you, if, the, if, if these things were fluctuating, um, you waited <laughs> until the fluctuation stopped and you got into a stationary state. And then you would have relations between these quantities in this stationary state. I mean, again, think of the ideal gas law, right? Think of PV equals nRT. You've got pressure, volume, and temperature all related by some constants. And that applies at equilibrium. You know, if you put a box of gas and you suddenly shove one side of it, then it wouldn't be clear at that moment what you meant by the pressure of the box of gas, because it would be much higher pressure near the shelf wall <laughs> and lower pressure on the other side. And you, to, you know, you wait a little while and the thing relaxes, and then you get a uniform pressure and a uniform temperature, and then you have relations between those things. So it's often I had it, especially it even occur to me what she had in mind. But at this at this conference, I was just at. Track. I was having a discussion at dinner and, a, and a, a woman said, a physicist said, oh, but you know, entropy only is defined for, for equal degree systems. And I wasn't thinking in this context. I thought, no, it's not. Of course, there's not equal degree thermodynamics and entropy on the bottom. This is what she was thinking about learning first just here. Um, what do we mean by a reversible process? Well, you know, the intuition is that there are some parameters that are under the uh, control of an external agent, and they're reversible in the sense that the agent can reverse what they did. That you start in some state, you do something, you let it settle down to a new state, and that that something can be undone, usually literally by, instead of pushing, pulling, right? <laughs> Uh, or something like that, right? Like, like, intuitively reversing it. And it comes back to, it. if it's a reversible process, then the agent can undo whatever was done and come back to the original state. And um, so, you know, here's an example. You have a gas in a piston, and you allow the piston to expand slowly, doing work as it goes, right, in a, in a fairly slow way. Uh, quasi-static way, as we would say. And as it does that, the temperature and the pressure of the gas will change. And then to reverse it, you know, you, you do work on the piston that exactly matches the piston that the work did on you and push the piston back. And when it comes back to its original state, you will have restored the original pressure. You can see how, in terms of these macroscopic quantities, that is a straightforward set of numbers. So this is what I just said. Uh, there are irreversible processes, right? In the sense that I just gave, you have a box that's partitioned into two parts by a sliding wall, and you have a gas, and the gas is in the right entirely in the right-hand part and the left-hand as a vacuum, and you slide the wall out, which involves no work because you know the, the pressure is this way and you're moving it this way. So it's you know, a workless process. You slide the partition out, the gas expands, the pressure changes, 
Uh, but if you intuitively reverse that by sliding the partitions back in, you don't get back to your original state. You then have a state where the gas is on both sides. Um, and then you say, well, yeah, but what if I want to get back to the original state with all the gas on one side? And then it might occur to you, well, if I push the wall in, you know, I can push all the gas back on the right, but if I don't do anything else, I'm going to do work in that process, I'm going to inject energy into the system, the temperature is going to go up, and when all the gas gets back on the right, it will not be at the same temperature and pressure as it was initially. Right? And you will have done work on the system. I mean, the obvious thing is that if it's a reversible process, in reversing it, the total amount of work done is zero, right? Whatever work was taken out gets put back in. Or else you're not, can't, can't come back to you in the initial state. Uh, in terms of reversible processes, everybody knows, I guess, but just to remind you, Carnot looked at the question of how you can convert heat energy into work. That is, the origin of the term thermodynamics, that is, means heat power, right? It's the theory of how much power, mechanical power, for running mills and other capitalistic devices um, you can manage to get out of the heat that you get by burning down forests and stuff. So that's what thermodynamics means. And Carno came up with limits, as we know, on the efficiency with which that can be done. And at the end of the day, you end up taking heat out of the heat reservoir at one temperature and dumping it into the heat reservoir at a different temperature, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I, I, I have no intention or actual ability to replicate <laughs> all of those results. OK, um, so that's why it's called thermodynamics. Um, now. Here is a reversible work-free process as far as standard classical thermodynamics goes. I have a box of gas partitioned into two sections by a sliding wall. The temperature and pressure of the two sides is the same. Uh, I slide the wall out, doing no work. I put it back in, doing no work. And I'm back to my original state. So that's a reversible process. And the entropy of the system has not changed. The thermodynamic entropy of the system has not changed. Okay? And this may seem like the most obvious thing in the world, but hold it in mind for a second. It is true. Everything I just said is true, even if the gases happen for one reason or another to be different colors. And even if at the beginning all the gas on the right was red and all the gas on the left is blue. And I pull out the partition, and the thing becomes uniformly purple. And I put the partition back in, and now I've got two boxes of purple gas. I have still done no thermodynamic work. I've done no work in the thermodynamic situation. Described in terms of the macroscopic thermodynamic parameters of temperature and pressure and volume has is unchanged, and this is, as far as we're concerned, a reversible process. Okay. Uh, so, it, what really, the key thing here is that you're saying color is not a thermodynamic quantity. Yes. Right. Maybe say a little bit why it's, it, it's not a thermodynamic quantity, because if actually I had some means of deriving work from the red and blue on, 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 on other sides that's not available when it's all, all purple, that I ought, in that case, I ought to count the color as a thermodynamic quantity. Right. Okay. It, it, right. So, I mean, if you had such a... It depends it, on what it, you can do with it. Yeah, it depends on what you can do with it. But offhand, I can't think of any way to get more mechanical work out of a box of gas that's blue on one side and red on the other than an equivalent box of gas at the same temperature and pressure that's, that's, that's all purple, right? Now, you can, you can make up fantasy physics, right. and this has been done, right. and say, well, what if I had a permeable membrane that right. was completely transparent to the blues and completely non-transparent to the reds, then I could do right. such and such, right? Because I could move these membranes around and they would have partial pressures and blah, blah, blah. And sure, you can make up fantasy physics, which is, Fantasy physics, okay? I'm not sure why you're doing it, 
You should be aware that's what you're doing. <laughs> right. I suspect that if one thought about it hard enough, one could bring up a way of doing it with real physics. But the conceptual issue is that that's what it, it, that, that, that's what it rides on. That's right. what we're going to agree on. Right. If, if you could do it with real physics, then we would all agree that, OK, we are wrong. Color is, in fact, a term right. quantity. Right. So, and the entropy has increased. Right. A absolutely right. And I said, you know, classical thermodynamics, you have macroscopic thermodynamics, which are those? I, I, certainly temperature, certainly pressure, certainly volume. Now, if you say, well, how do you know there are more? I don't know there are more, right? I mean, you know, propose some and, and try and explain how they're relevant for extracting mechanical energy out of heat energy and let's see where it goes. But, you know. Yeah, so, Tim, I, I mean, it seems to me that the, the remark Wayne made was the germane one here. So this is maybe just a slightly irrelevant side question, but I mean, what, what reason would there be to doubt, since of course we, you know, we can construct things like photo detectors and, and so on that can detect the colors of things, what reason is there to suspect that we couldn't make the kind of semi-permeable membrane you're talking about in non-fantasy physics? Uh, if, if you... It, you could imagine, I guess, some very complicated color sorting device. Right. But now you're going to have to ask whether using it is reversible, for example, in the way that pushing a piston is. Right. You put right. in work, you get back to work. I, right. mean, I don't know how much work you have to do right. to get your right. device to work. Right. You know, right. And so if you're interested in the thing Carnot was interested in, which was just very practical, right? right? I have a bunch of heat energy. I really like to convert as much of it as I can into mechanical energy. If you have a hyper fancy membrane that requires a billion volt, you know, you know, all this energy right. work, then you're defeating Good. your practical purpose. Good. 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 Right? Good. I mean, I just say if, if this is like actual color, I mean you understand it, like it's not too hard to figure out how you would do it, right? You if like one is blue and one is red, you just try a bunch of blue layers this way, a bunch of red layers this way, and then on average we'll, this will absorb more of the red layers than this one, and then they'll be separated inside of the boxes, right? So it seems like I find it not worth it. Well, again, this is getting a little bit. Again, we would have to wonder what the energy cost of doing so. I really doubt you're going to get it all blue on one side and all red on the other. Yeah. By the means you just suggested, yeah. right? Yeah, so you might get a little gradient going. No, you're right. right. Yeah. 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 So I, I suggest we not, like, I want to emphasize everybody agrees that if you could right. do, do, do it, then we ought to count them as yes. Yes. And that that's seems right, to be right, the germane right. remark. And, that, and that's the best, the right. best germane remark. Right. Right. I'm skeptical, and, 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 and I totally agree with what Tim says. At first thought, there doesn't seem no, to be any way of doing it. Yeah. It's a separate question whether a really clever person would right. think of a reversible way exactly. of do, do, doing it. But the conceptual point doesn't ride on that. Right, right, right. And, and let, let me make one more. I know there were other candidates. Let me make one more. You know, when you go a certain distance toward what is, as it were, in principle possible but not practically possible, you end up right at Maxwell's demon. Maxwell's demon Just so. was a device that could defeat the laws of classical thermodynamics and just showed Maxwell considered it to be a proof, and I think he was absolutely right, that the particular law that, he, that is accepted in classical thermodynamics cannot be a law I mean, in the strict sense, because it could be defeated in principle if you had a quick-fingered enough demon. Um, nothing to do, by the way, I mean, you can go over this. I don't think we did this last year. Nothing to do with whether the entropy of the demon goes up or whatever. Nothing to do with the point but a demon would be a technology, a physically possible technology, as far as he was concerned, that would defeat. And therefore, he was making the point that when you're doing thermodynamics, you are working with macroscopic quantities in a kind of rough-handed way, mm -hmm. right? And if you become too fine-fingered, then you're just not doing, you're not, not in the topic that he was interested in, which is what you can do you know, in a big factory by shoving stuff around, mm -hmm. by attaching poles and pistons and pushing things, right? Um, that just, you know, was worth it. No, 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 but wait, Tim, I, I'm, I'm confused. But say a little more about uh, uh, in what sense it had nothing to do with what happens to the entropy of the demon. Because his point was that the particular law that 
which was accepted as a law of thermodynamics, that Maxwell was discussing was not the second law, it was not as we do, it was the law that you, if you have a, 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 a gas at, um, at constant temperature, okay. you can't induce a temperature gradient in it without doing work Good. on the gas. Good. And the demon, no matter what happens to him, no, does no, zero work on the gas. No question. But then we want to, um, when we discuss foundational topics in physics, and I, so, so maybe this is a question about whether thermodynamics counts as such a topic. I don't know. Where, where there, there's a long tradition of thinking that some version of the second law is going to turn out to be fairly robust um, against technological change right. and so on and so forth. You're presenting it here as if it's, it's very linked to a particular historical moment in technological development or something like that in a way that's, um, well, I, 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 guess, I guess here's the question. Are you encouraging us to think that this thought that is fairly technologically robust, even if not infinitely technologically, the, the very thought that it's fairly technologically robust is a confusion, and we shouldn't be thinking of that. No, what, what, I, I mean, let me go the first part of the statement you made. You said, in the foundations. I mean, right. the point I'm making is that under this conception, classical thermodynamics is not a foundational theory. So I take, yes. I take it back. You're right. Good. Okay. All of us agree to that. Okay. Address the second. And, and, and we do want to but we do want to recover it. Right. Right. We want it to emerge. Address, address the second question. Somebody says, for example, if Maxwellian demons are possible, I don't know if it, yeah. I don't know exactly what sense of possible I'm talking about here. Right. Somebody says, if Maxwellian demons are possible, how come natural selection didn't take advantage of it? <laughs> or something like that. Okay? So you want to say Oh, um, um, they are possible. They're not violations of, say, the microscopic laws of, of, of uh, classical mechanics. But there is a there is a kind of robustness which it's in our interests to understand, which is a maybe not a fundamental in that sense, but a deep feature of how the world works. Okay, and we want to get a picture of that law. Um, which makes the, the robustness, to the extent that it exists, transparent and vivid. Look, I certainly agree that where there is robustness of the kind you're talking about, you'd like an explanation. Right. Right. Um, the particular appeal to evolution strikes me as just a complete non-starter. I mean, I, I'm just cribbing from getting it. Wheels are really good. Right. <laughs> Nobody right. evolved wheels. Good. Right. There are no birds with Good. wheels. There are no animals with wheels. Good. Right. And there are reasons why right. they didn't evolve. Or, but they or, don't have to do with it being that hard to make a wheel. Or, right. It's not that hard to make a wheel. Fair enough. <laughs> or somebody says somebody wants good reasons not to invest in a in a Maxwell's demon startup. Okay. Yeah. Or something like that. <laughs> uh, right. Um, right. Some so guy says, look, I have right. a device, I can you sit say, it in the ocean, I don't and it'll come out of electrical right. energy in the ocean. Will get say, ready. say, I don't right. think it's going to work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and, and yeah. signing the historical particulars of what Maxwell was dealing with when he set this up doesn't address questions like that. And I, and I do think when we embed this in statistical mechanics, <laughs> uh, and it, you know, we haven't gotten to anything, I haven't said anything about statistical anything yet. Right. We I'm just trying to make it like a yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no, this is great. I mean, I, if, if anybody here is annoyed by what just happened, you should just leave. <laughs> <laughs> this is all it's going to be. It's not going to change, right? You just get a ticket and go back and go back. <laughs> So I have no, yeah, okay. no I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy. I mean, I think, and, and this is not a deeply held, right, something I can defend at length. Right. My belief is that when you embed it in statistical mechanics and you're talking about systems with 
very, 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 very many subsystems. And you can kind of characterize what it would be to be able to act kind of in an indifferent way on huge groups of these things right. as opposed to act. Right. Then you'll get an idea about why there's this robustness, right. which also means, let me say, when people, and there are God knows a hell of a lot of them, talk about one particle gases and right. put them in pistons right. and talk about the laws of thermodynamics of a one single particle gas. They should they, just leave too. Yeah. <laughs> this is a conceptual error. Right? This is just a conceptual error. All of this apparatus, all of this classical apparatus does not apply. Right. And in a way, you know, that's more or less what Maxwell was saying. You get down to a fine enough scale, and all this apparatus that I've developed doesn't apply. So there's an argument from presentations of Maxwell's demon, which I, I will not be able to present in detail. But it, 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 how, does, how does the demon know the velocity of the incoming particle? And, and then they get into a discussion about, well, you've got to do something to the particle to measure, and then you're off on that. You've, you've said measurement, and then a whole lot of other things happen. But so the point of, I'm just trying to understand the point you make. So the, the point is, uh, okay, we can avoid all of that. Let's just get uh, uh, Maxwell's gambling demon who just opens the the gate of course, every now and then, and the robustness then comes and, and lets a particle through. And so the robustness then comes from the fact that most facts of these gamblers are very. They get the usual thing. It, it, it takes a miraculous gambling right. demon to actually get the kind of hot, uncalled set. Right. Or, or you could look. You could use the reversibility arguments, or you you could use the recurrence arguments, or whatever sure. okay. that are going to tell you that it's certainly possible to violate the second law. Right? Just reverse time, reverse everything. The entropy that went up will go down, or wait long enough if you've got a closed system, and by recurrence, the entropy that went up will go down. All of those are arguments that the second law cannot be a fundamental yeah. law, by which we mean a law you can't break. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just yeah. try to So that can, be, that can be an argument that it can't be a fundamental law. It's just, that's just an argument that like if, if the fundamental laws are time reversible or... Right. This, yeah. In the yeah. setting that everybody accepted that the underlying mechanics was, right. you know, mechan was reversible right. to time right. mechanics. Right. Um, but just to clear this up, I mean, maybe it's good to have a a sort of definition of what one means. I think when people are talking about an actual demon, they have in mind something like this. You can find some macro state okay, um, of an isolated system, or you have a larger isolated system of which some subpart of it is in a certain macro state, such that it follows just from it being in that macro state, together with the usual calculational uh, you know, the, the methods of taking uniform distribution of the microstates compatible with that microstate, that if you come back 10 minutes later, the entropy is going to be lower, okay, with overwhelmingly high probability. When you've got a thing like that, that's when you say you've got a Maxwell steam okay. Right. And, uh, I mean, there, there was a back and forth between David and I it goes back decades and may eventually see the white publication barrier. It's not me. I said barrier. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, about exactly this right. uh, the comments that David made at several right. times. Right. Chance. And right. if anybody's interested, we can go into that. Although it's, uh, right. We may sort of cover a, a deal of it in what I'm about to say. Uh, yeah. yeah. I just have a question before uh, we go on this. So the, the, the color as we saw solid the laser example is of course a physical uh, property. Sure, it's a, absolutely a physical property. So, uh, just be sure that, uh, and these are not just labels that we assign to the bottom. No, 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 no. I mean real you know, physical color. You could just see it go from red to blue to purple. Actual uh, red. Yeah, your eyes could see the mixing. And your uh, sure. Right. It just just it's not at all obvious. It's a thermodynamically interesting property. Right. And it's not obvious to me that it's not. So. Yeah, yeah, I know it's not. Right, because you know, these things have different chemical properties. You can do different things. You can be differently affected with the laser. But again, I want to emphasize the key conceptual point we're in agreement on. Yeah. That, right. that that's what counts. Can right. you manipulate red and blue things differently? Right. That's what counts. In, in a way, if you just go back to my original right. quasi-definitions, 
I said, when you're doing classical thermodynamics, you have a set of thermodynamic macroscopic variables. If you add to that set, okay, then you have a version of, you can have a version of classical thermodynamics that's different from another version that has not expanded the set. And you know, then you'd have to ask, okay, how are you expanding it? And what's the technology for, you know, for utilizing these additional characteristics? Ultimately, again, for getting more mechanical work out of heat, right? That's what you wanted to do. That's, that's I, think, the I think that this is a very important point. That, uh, thermodynamics, it starts with you've got this set of thermodynamic properties, things you know, different, you know, what are you going to count as, to, as same thermodynamic state? And that ultimately has to do with, with what can you get extract, how, what means do you have of extracting work from the system and means of manipulation. And this is all fine, and it's all fine because we don't think that the thermodynamics in this sense is not a fundamental theory. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. But on that point, I mean, if we can assume that no theory we have is ultimately fundamental, what do we mean by saying that this one is not fundamental, but this one is? But who said we can assume that? Oh, say, say, say that again? I mean, if we're going to assume that like any current theory that we have is not the ah. most fundamental theory possible, how do we say that this theory is fundamental but this one is? Well, uh, actually, here's an interesting thing about the word fundamental. Like, um, I'm pretty sure that in, if, if, if you do a word search on everything I've ever written for the word fundamental, the only time I've ever used it, when it is when I've said a certain theory is not fundamental. Okay. Okay. Right. So we have, we often have very good reasons for thinking that that something is not right. fundamental, right. Right. and you don't need to have right. a fundamental theory right. In, right. in order to say something's right. not fundamental. If you think that these kinds of mean quantity, these kinds of considerations that are rel relative to means of manipulation don't belong in a fundamental theory then we could say this is not fundamental. Okay. Right. So, so, certainly, Bell, Bell, John Bell Institute, you know, if Bell tells you that, the, and you agree that the word measurement does not occur in a fundamental theory, I don't have to have a fundamental theory in order to say, okay, when you talk about measurement, you know, you know right. fundamental right. physics. And, and, and here's another criterion, which is the one we've already used. If, if your theory postulates things, it calls laws. But you acknowledge that it's physically possible for the laws to be violated, then I would say your your theory is not fundamental. Right. Right. A characteristic of a fundamental law is that if you regard it as fundamental, you can't break it. And and so I mean this was you know this was Boltzmann's response to the recurrence you know the the recurrence observation with people you know he said oh I've I derived the second law of thermodynamics from fundamental, you know, from fundamental physics, that is fundamental mechanics, mm -hmm. and they say, oh no, that can't be right because it's contrary to occurrence. Mm -hmm. And he just shrugged and said, you should live so long. I mean, mm -hmm. that is, he knew the laws. And again, the point of Maxwell's demon: these are not fundamental laws; they can be broken. Yet, if you wait long enough, you'll break this law, which means it's not a fundamental law. It's just a statistical regularity. I mean, this is part of embedding all of this in the statistical mechanics. It robs thermodynamics of even the pretension of being fundamental. So I'm wondering how, having so stated after physics, um, the laws are something you know, meaty and pithy and information rich and short and you know, you've got that half hour with God uh, experiment. Uh -huh. which is, so, uh, in that case, it, it, there's some, you have some nice, like, best system, and it turns out there's a few exceptions, but that could still be the best system in some sense. I, does, does, do your laws have to be unbreakable? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the way unions usually do it. It's a good question that lots of people have raised, Look, if your real interest is uh, just to get a good idea of what's going, that that is, that is, I mean, I don't want to sidetrack this into a whole discussion, but but um, um, I guess there's an attitude like, look, if we're going to metaphysically deflate the laws in a big way, we're just going to talk about them as summaries or something like that. Why is a summary? that's exceptionlessly true so much better than a summary that's almost exceptionlessly true. 
um, um, or something like that. That's a point that lots of people have brought up. Um, I mean, yeah, maybe Barry's in a better position to say something about this than, than I. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I think what that shows is that the union of counter lawyers isn't exactly the same one that the, tra that the tradition in physics had in mind. And the question is whether what's gained philosophically that, that having this deflated account is worth making a revision in how we think about laws. Right, and, and in a certain, I mean, I would say from a less, you know, um, sympathetic, sympathetic <laughs> point, yeah. right, it's, it's sort of, you know, built into the Humean thing that the laws just aren't fundamental in the way that I think of them, and it's somebody who believes in the law as, but as, as basic ontological posits that don't derive from anything else. Uh, it's not so surprising that the human account wouldn't have that kind of fundamental. From my point of view, it just follows from a law being that kind of thing that it can't be broken. Right. It just wouldn't be a law. Right. I mean, whereas from the human point of view, I, I guess the thought would be um, um, so far, the evidence is encouraging if you take it. Optimistic right. meta induction right. that, that you are going to be able to discover a genuinely exceptionalist pattern. The best system. Um, that, 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 you know, that's, that, that there is going to be a best system that looks like that. Um, um, and, and that that's a feature of the scientific project that's worth right. having that, on. That's the faith behind the whole scientific project. Right, right. Uh, right. There right. will be regularities. How did you just do this optimistic meta induction? Because the best, the best optimistic meta induction is. The realization that we've always been wrong about you know, yeah. because we have fuller your laws are going to be because it's gotten better and better. It, it has gotten better, and, and also, of course, this isn't something that divides the anti-unions from the unions. Um, um, they're both to the extent that they're optimistic about the scientific project depending on something like the optimistic meta If you want me to, to you know, give you a refutation of skepticism, of, of, of inductive skepticism, or something, I'm, I'm not going to have one. But there is another, I mean, that was very erratic and so on, so of course I can't agree with it. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, there is another worry, which is not exactly the one you're, you're saying, because as you say, the, 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 suppose the following situation, Occur, and, and so let me just ask you this: uh, There is something really short and really pithy and really useful, really, really useful that God can do. An exceptional future. No. Oh. Like classical thermodynamics. Says you want right. to make you want to make en heat engines. We can't know. Right. Right. Real pithy. And then he says, of course. Yeah, there are going to be some exceptions to that, but you should live so long. Did I say and, I guess I did. Yeah, I think you did. Um, and <laughs> was it just but, but you should live so long, and, and the amount of time it would take me to explain, you know, why the exceptions occur, and how often they'll occur, and under what circumstances, that would break your head. So, you know, you wanted something short and useful. This is short and useful. No, no, no. There is, and it's short and useful and fallible. There is something infallible and long and complicated. But you want it short and useful, and, and, and therefore those yeah, yeah. are the laws. No, no, no. I mean, I, 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 I don't think the interesting thing to do here is to have a debate about the meaning of the English word law. Um, um, I, I, my feeling would be, if there's nothing short and exceptionless, that gives you the pithy stuff, that would be a failure of my highest hopes for the scientific project. Um, um, I don't, maybe there's going to be nothing short and pithy, okay? What's pithy? Uh, you know, meaty, um, substantial, short and informative, okay? Maybe there's going to be, maybe there's going to be nothing short and, and informative to, to the degree that we're hoping for. If that happens, then you and I can sit here and have a debate about whether to call it a law or not. I'm, I'm not going to care so much. I mean, the, the hope that's encouraged, on my view, by the history of the scientific project 
is that there's going to be stuff that's short and pithy and informative and exceptionalistly true. Right. That, I, and again, this may be my last comment, because we are getting a little sidetracked on this. Sorry. Uh, you know, when you appeal to the history of science, the history of science, as I'm thinking of it, is a history where finding any exception, no matter how rare, yeah. is dead. Yeah, it's deadly to the project as it's been conceived. Yeah, I agree with that. So the question, and so you might say the project as conceived was conceived more along the what my thought of what it was. No. That, yeah, no, yes, it was, but it was also conceived with the idea what the laws are and the decrees of the divine being. But the laws it was uh, the project was conceived of with the idea. Of what the laws are are the principles that govern how. I I I I guess I define find any interesting point in history of physics or any such a field. It's really easy to find. It's really easy to find in Descartes. I mean, really easy. And in Malebranche, and in Berkeley. So if I were to ask, if, if if I were to ask somebody off the top of their head to name great physicists, Descartes and Malebranche and Berkeley, well, Descartes, 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 Descartes would be no, 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 Descartes is not considered to be a great. Physicist. But he, but he, but he, it's not about the greatness of physicism. It's a, it's a matter of the concept of law, the law, the kind of, the oh, con, and how the concept of law I right. spread so, in, in the, you, know, you, you always try and tar on my side with theology. Right. And I just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he just still <laughs> Okay. Maybe that should be a different. Yeah, I think we're. I think we're wondering all the time. I, 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 I did want to say one more thing about it, though. I think David's just so story about the half hour with God actually did the people on the Union side of this no no favor, actually, because it, it emphasized not uh, just a, an aspect of what this these side of your actually. Okay, I mean it would be if, if that's so. I think it would be very useful to try and formulate, uh, have a more careful formulation. I agree. Yeah, we should go and make that available for people to consider, right? Because uh, I, yeah, I mean I think I'm one of the people who you, you know, it's good. It's a striking thing to say, right? I mean David's a good writer. And he says gives these striking scenarios and they stick in your head, and so that's what you think about it. If you're but if some corners have been cut, you know, then you need to paste the corners back on. A brief so. joke about having your feet stuck in theology. I mean, <laughs> um, there was a story that Sidney Morgan was used to tell about a paper he got from an undergraduate where the guy said uh, Galileo had one foot firmly planted in the Middle Ages while with the other he saluted the rising sun. <laughs> <laughs> So, we're still in, in topic one, classical thermodynamics. Um, you introduce the entropy as a function of the thermodynamic quantities uh, at equilibrium. And we had some talks last year about the details of this. I, I, I can't reproduce the details. There's a lot more. Uh, Nina talked about some, Carmen talked about some, a lot more we said here. But I, I don't know, but I'll say a little bit. Uh, and you talk about how you can compare, you can ascribe these entropies uh, of different systems by various arguments that you use by introducing reversible operations. Because you, know, you can then appeal to that. Now, I, the concept, I, I should just add here, what is the concept of entropy? And uh, Feynman, I, I had a wonderful thing about MPD. It's on the website. And he used this analogy, which I thought was really nice. Because, and, and again, you have to always keep in mind this idea that you know, the sea out there in front of us contains enough energy right, to do whatever we want forever. And you say, well, how can there be an energy crisis? The sea is, you know, calculate the number of bergs, or whatever the hell you want, ETUs, that are in the sea, right? Um, why can't I solve the energy crisis by putting a device that I stick in the sea and it pumps out electricity and the temperature, the, you know, the energy comes out of the sea and therefore the temperature of the sea goes down and that'll help global warming on top of that. Mm -hmm. Why can't I do that? 
right? And and you know, Feynman and, and entropy is a kind of characterization of the availability of energy for use for. And Feynman had this nice example. He said, you know, he used to go um, swimming a lot at the at, at the seaside, and it would be these. Uh, you, you'd get out, and of course, you'd go to your towel to dry off, but sometimes rain would come. And when the rain came, you know, you would, would come and you'd have to grab your towel and try and dry yourself, and blah, blah, blah. And that there's a quality of the towel, which at a certain point you realize you've got this towel in your hand, and you're doing this, and you're not getting any drier, right? <laughs> Um, it's the, you know that that some, you know there's as much water in the towel as there is on your skin, and so this you know this action, which is usually good for drying you off, is no longer good for drying you off. And then you know it, it, this is like this is like coming to thermal equilibrium, you know, an analogy of coming to thermal equilibrium. And I I I haven't thought through exactly how that goes through precisely, but it just struck me. I mean, it was a striking image, and I just thought, I just thought. Uh, okay. Uh, the change in entropy, classically, we get this nice formula that the change in the entropy S is delta Q over T, where delta Q is the reversible incremental change in heat energy in the system. So if you're among the changes that you use, if you're building a Carnot cycle, is of course you sometimes take your box of gas and stick it. Uh, at, onto a heat reservoir that's at a different temperature, and you either absorb or emit heat energy, which can be uh, calibrated, right, can be quantified. And you're doing it, because you're doing all this quasi-statically at a temperature, and that you can, you, you can calculate how much, in, the, in these sorts of interchanges, how the, how the entropy of your, of your system has changed by this formula. Um, this is just a note, and we didn't talk about this, and if people were interested, it's, you know, it's interesting, it's a nice thing, we've never seen it. You can rearrange this formula in an obvious way to be a definition of T. If you have, if you have an independent handle on X, right, and then define the temperature of the system. And for certain systems, like icing systems, uh, magnetic spin systems in an external magnetic field. By that definition, you can then get negative temperatures, and the negative temperatures are higher than all positive temperatures, and they have these you know, properties that kind of move with it. But you know, it all makes perfect sense. It, this actually came up in this new track thing, um, because uh, Ted Jacobson gave a talk in which he suggested in proof that it was his feeling that um, that, that the vacuum state in quantum field theory is the highest en highest entropy state. He was really worried about entanglement entropy. I mean, so this is you're starting to see how all this stuff starts to cross. But I don't want to go into the details of what he proposed. The point was the proposal was that the vacuum state is the highest entropy state. And so as you pump energy into a system and take it above the vacuum. The entropy drops. That, of course, is not what happens with a box of gas. And, and if you do that, then by this definition, you can you can see that the temperature is going to be negative. And he he said that, and then he said, "Oh, and I did this calculation. This thing turns out to have a negative temperature. I don't understand." And I said, "But look, you know, you should expect that. You should have expected that to happen once you said you thought that the vacuum state was the highest entropy state, and you're using entropy in this way. You should expect negative temperatures from the get-go." And then. You know, Gary Horowitz said, well, if it has a negative temperature and now you bring a thermometer, what will it do? And you say, no, that's just confusion. Right? Now you're bringing in a different system. And of course, you could couple it to a thermometer and you could figure out what would happen. It's not like your thermometer will blow up. <laughs> anyway, um, so we could go, I mean, they're, they're, you know, it's, if you've never seen this stuff about, about icing models in external fields, it's very cute. It's very easy to understand. We can do that sometimes if people haven't seen it. Uh, okay. Um, what are the characteristics of the classical thermodynamic entropy? It's clearly individualistic in the sense that a single box of gas, even if it's the only box of gas around, has a thermodynamic entropy. 
if it's in equilibrium. Um, is there a classical notion set at this level of description of non-equilibrium entropy? I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's some people who think there just isn't. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't thought about it hard enough if anybody has to be not obvious to me. OK, that was our first entropy. And that was the one that, that was tied to Carnell engines, and it's very practical. And then there's this idea that uh, you can understand the classical laws of thermodynamics by embedding all this in a statistical theory of the components of these systems, that the systems have many, many, many parts. And when you think about how the parts interact, and you start appealing to laws of large numbers and various things that you can then recover, uh, understand why macroscopic systems obey the laws of classical thermodynamics to the extent that they do. And so when you get to Boltzmann, you're now doing statistical mechanics because Boltzmann is committed to the idea that these macroscopic systems are made up of many, 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 many atoms. Now that was, again, for those of you who haven't read the history of it, it was very contentious. Boltzmann was very much in the minority. The kinetic account of heat was not, you know, it's not obvious that the kinetic theory of heat is correct. It's not obvious that you can reduce temperature to something statistical. Boltzmann, you know, ended up committing suicide. It's a sad story. You don't mind me going back to your point about there's no obvious way of um, doing non-equilibrium classical thermodynamics. Obvious to me. Okay. So there may be an obvious way, I just don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I feel like the way that you, it's like typically done in physics is you just say, I'm going to assign um, thermodynamic variables to each infinitesimal region of my system, and then that can vary throughout the whole system. I can specify that to be something, and then now you, and then you can specify the ways that the different parts interact, and then now you have a way of having right. so, your entire system be out of Right. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, and I know you can do this kind of in statistical mechanics, and basically you take your box of gas, which has an Avogadro's number of molecules, and then you can break it up into, into smaller boxes, mm -hmm. but still big enough that each of these sub-boxes has yeah. many, 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 Right, you can't you can't re refine it so far that, that each box is either one or zero. Right, you have to still have many, 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 and then you can apply statistical methods to these little boxes, and maybe talk about temperature profiles and pressure profiles that way. Um, I mean, you're right, except that I mean, typically we don't actually keep it as finite size. We just like actually let it go and continue learning and get the right answer anyway. Well, if you no, if you let it go too no. small, you better get the wrong answer because it's what you're doing is physically wrong. It's incorrect. I mean, I mean, like, I mean, you can solve the situation where you just have like a continuous um, temperature gradient, right? And, like, so technically, in order to have a temperature, you have to like have an actual like finite set of mass that you can say have like this, this, this finite, this infinitesimal, but still no, not infinitesimal, finite set of boxes like has um, like obeys like the method cannot or whatever. But then you just let the boxes go to zero, and it's then have a continuous temperature gradient travel. But that's fantasy physics. I mean, actually, people do that though. Fine, but they're doing fantasy physics, and you need to think if it works. It's some kind of unrealistic idealization that may make calculations easier, but it's not. It, they're making errors. They're they're putting clearly false claims in. If you have an actual box of gas, and you make the subpartition too small, you're screwed. But I thought we were really talk, but I thought we were really talking about like the actual properties. We're just talking about the classical theory of gas. We said you don't know how. To, in, like, in class, like, we basically just treat it as like a continuum. We treat it as like a continuum. But, no, you don't understand. It, it, okay. it, 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 the first thing you do in classical cases is you look at equilibrium. Now, if, if I divide this thing into these subpartitions and say, but wait, we have, they all have to be in equilibrium. They really are only all in equilibrium when the whole damn thing has come to equilibrium, and then I'm not doing non-equilibrium not, not equilibrium theory anymore. Right, but you had the concept of like local equilibrium. It's in equilibrium with the things like the side, and then you just take a continuous limit. Are, 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 everything you're saying is correct, except when, when you say continuous limit. 
Um, so so yeah, what, what you can do is you can chop, so yeah, suppose I've got a get a get, or actually let's do a bar of iron because the heat goes yeah. more slowly. If I've got a bar of iron, the temperature gradient. And the um, progress of the of, of heat through the bar is slow compared to the vibration of the molecules and stuff. I can tr divide up into small things and treat 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 the little things at little, little things as if they're in a local loop where we're in a, in a trivia temperature and, thing, and things like that. That depends on um, not check chopping it up small enough that, that, that there's a negligible temperature gradient within the, the thing, but large enough that, I, that, that it's got a macroscopic number of molecules. Now, the next thing I can do is I can now write down a continuous function for that temperature gra gradient, maybe write down a heat equation as if it is a, and disregard the fact that it's grainy at the ground level. And that's fine as long as I'm not probing, probing it be below the level of that kind of, of, of that sort of thing. I think the problem is when physicists say I'm going to take a continuum limit or I'm going to take an infinitesimal um, uh, uh, volume, they, in, that, what they really mean is uh, if they say something is infinitesimal is that it's small compared to the macroscopic variables that I'm using. Like, one of my favorite sentences is in Tolman's book on statistical mechanics where he says, take an infinitesimal volume which is large enough to, to contain a great many molecules. <laughs> right, now, philosophers... You have, you have standard analysis of your molecules. Right, philosophers find that funny because we think that infinitesimal means smaller than any rational number, but that's not clearly not what it means. What it means is, so small that I'm small compared to the the, the size of the box, right. Right. and it, what it usually means is I'm going to replace the sum with an integration. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So anyway, as I said, if there, if, you know the the, the the attribution of a classical entropy to a system that is not in equilibrium. And again, I'll just repeat this. It, it's not, at least to say, straightforward right, how to do that. And I guess you'd have to think hard about it. The, the, the apparatus isn't really set up to deal with it. But the least of things that are close to you can just sign in your piece. Right? That's why we, you know, this is a Well, but you don't need, you see, so take, you can have the second law without being able to assign entropies to things not in equilibrium. You just talk about non-reversible transitions. Between two right. right. So if I have the box of gas and all the gases on this side and I pull out the partition, I, I can assign an entropy to the initial state. Then I pull out the thing, and then I have this transient state where there's a, you know, all kinds of pressure gradients and God knows what. Maybe I can't assign them entropies at all. But I do say when it comes back into equilibrium, at the end, it's going to be at a higher entropy. Right. So you can have the second law without being able to track the entropy continuously through the non-equilibrium transition, right. which I think is what is often done. I mean, it'll be clear that when we get to Boltzmann, we can perfectly well assign entropies to things not in equilibrium, and it's all done in the same way. It's all much you know, very smooth. I mean, conceptually, there are no problems at all. So you think that in, uh, at this point that people then want to um, have then this assumption that we do everything quasi-statically in order to track right. in some idealistic way the transition from this low entropy state to this high entropy state, but in, in some way, right. you do, if, you, if you're not interested in this um, curve in between these states, you don't need to make this, this And And not this every physical that. transition is quasi-static. Yeah, okay. And, and, right. and uh, actually, let me make a comment. This is a purely terminological comment, which I don't know if anybody else here has, has, has noticed. It. I'm sure Wayne has, but maybe nobody else has. There is an official meaning for the term adiabatic. Okay? You've probably all heard one way or another the term adiabatic here. And if you know your Greek, you know it means ah, alpha primitive, dia through, bateo. Transport, right? It means it means that there's no heat flow. Yes. But 
Physicists, at least half the time, use the word adiabatic when what they mean is quasi-static. That is, you're doing things very slowly so that you're never very far from the equilibrium. And that can include heat flow, right? You can, you can do heat flow by attaching something to sequentially warmer heat baths in a very slow manner. And that can be quasi-static, but it sure ain't adiabatic. And, and this is just a warning that you should be aware when you read adiabatic that it has a, a proper meaning. By proper, I mean more your Greek, buddy. Um, a proper meaning, and then it has been co-opted to mean something that quasi-static actually describes perfectly well as well in Latin. And um, sometimes it means quasi-static and reversible. OK. Because quasi-static and reversible aren't the same thing. That's right. You can do something very slowly, but not reversibly. Yes, absolutely. So conceptually, keep these th three things separate and you know, have some little warning bells go off when you're reading the literature that people may be using the wrong names. Because it's my observation that that happens. Yes. I, I take it. It's you just have to be very clear. See, the problem is that half the, you, you said they use it, it, it half the time in a sense. Right? If, 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 yeah. they, if they always use it in that yeah, yeah. etymologically incorrect way all the time, be fine. <laughs> yeah, so just yeah, be careful. Just read what we in any instance, just read carefully to see what they're doing at. Yeah. Yeah. So if we were to conclude that at a thermodynamical level, we should not assign entropy to systems that are outside of the equilibrium, we eventually will have to confront the problem when we try to think of black hole energy. Because the law for black hole, the identification of area with the entropy, is an identification that is presumably done. It right. wants to be done independently of whether the system has reached equilibrium or not. Is there, is there is a law or is an identification that is supposed to be valid outside of the equilibrium? Right. So I mean, that's how it's. No, I understand. I mean, I mean, the other thing that's going on here is time scales. So then you say, look, if it only applies to equilibrium, what do you mean by equilibrium? I said by equilibrium is when things go stationary. But stationary over what time scale? So things can be, as it were, effectively stationary over the scale of a minute and not at all stationary over the scale of 100,000 years. So you know, for each of these systems, you're, you're, all of these terms are approximate. And in different scales, they're, they're applicable. You just have to think through what scale you're going to That's right. So I don't, I don't think it'll kill it. I understand what you're saying about black holes. And anyway, you're not going to deal with black holes. Well, I mean, people do try to apply literally heat engines to black holes, right? There's this whole yeah. thing about dropping boxes of gases and letting the gas go and all that. And they're trying to you know, make Carnot engines out of black holes. And then I think you really do have to think about what in the world you're doing. OK. Uh, so Boltzmann entropy is statistical mechanical entropy applies to systems composed of many, many parts, which are based on classical mechanics. No, no reason if you're doing you know, classical thermodynamics that has to be true. It, it, matter could be continuous and uh, you know, heat could be a substance like caloric and you could still have the laws of classical thermodynamics, right? There's nothing in them that requires this. But if you're doing statistical mechanics, it's statistical exactly because you're dealing with large collections and you're dealing with that. Uh, so we all know that in classical mechanics, the precise microscopic state of the system is given by a point in phase space, which specifies the position and momentum of every particle in the system. Uh, and there is, we all know, there is a, what I would call a natural measure on phase space. This is often people call it the Lebesgue measure, which drives me a little crazy because again, the Lebesgue measure is a measure over the real numbers, it's not a measure over any physical space. It's you use Lebesgue measure on the natural coordinates, but then you have to explain what the natural coordinates are. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's just technically Lebesgue measures are mathematical. Not physical. Uh, and in the Boltzmann approach, you have the space space that represents all the possible states that your system can be in, and you start with a partition. You chop it up into regions. I think it's important to say what that natural measure is. Hmm? You said there's a natural measure you didn't Sure. So in, 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 in classical mechanics, again, the, the, a point in phase space, it, you're, you're, you're identifying it, 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 some of the coordinates are, as it were, have to do with positions of things. And the natural measure over that are, is a measure of 
distance, right? A, a, a uniform measure of distance. And the other measure is a momentum, but of course, if momentum is velocity, and that's distance by time. So you have a natural measure in seconds and meters of velocities. And you know what you mean by saying the velocity of something is twice that of something else, and your coordinates can reflect that by having the coordinate values be twice as high if the velocities are twice as high. The momentum. Yeah, the momentum. Right, yeah. The momentum, right. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's uniform in, in canonical variables, position yeah. and mo momentum, not, not velocity. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. right. Yeah, so. Yeah. And this is for you, or this case. What's natural about it? What's natural about it? I would say what's natural about it is, first of all, the measure is coming from a physical measure. The measure, I mean, at least the spatial part, which is really what's driving it. You need the mass to get the momentum. What's driving it is space and time measures. I mean, I, 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 space has a metric, and time has a metric. That's what, those are physical facts. The stationarity of the measure under a Louisville flow? You just said that that's part of the... I don't think that's part of the depth. I, don't, I, I think you people knew the right measure to use on phase space before they had the real theory. I think it's a fact about, you know, about Hamiltonian flows that they satisfy the Mills theorem. I don't think that's a definition. I don't think you use that feature to define. It's not like analytically, oh, throw whatever measure on you need to keep this flow constant. People knew that that, because it's the natural measure. It's going twice as fast. We knew what that meant, right? But it's well, got I, twice the length. You keep bouncing between velocity. Okay, okay. And I know that's I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a box of gas that are all the same mass. Yeah, but they have to have different masses in which case uh, okay. to do, then, they define your measure in terms of velocity and define it in terms Fine, of but and mass is all different. Time, space, and mass right. are all to me natural quantities. Right. So, but, but okay, natural means defined in terms of natural quantities. Well, then. Any function of this uh, of, of those quantities is, is going to be um, this is can't be the, the unique measure. Yes, I, know, okay. I mean now now we're playing the you try to give a definition and I'll come up with a clever counterexample game, which I am not really no, I don't see the purpose of it. No, because I, I I'm, I'm worried about what we He's we worried do. about what you're yeah. going to put this word to yeah, what, this word natural right, yeah. later on. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. The only thing I was trying to do was to distinguish the measure on phase space from what is properly mathematically defined as a bed measure. Because people always right. call it the bed measure, and that's just an error. It's the bed measure with respect, with to, respect to, to canonical, canonical coordinates. Right. So now you have to talk about what you mean by canonical coordinates. Right. And, you know, I mean, there are various ways to go here. Uh, this is not, and I don't want to deny these are interesting questions. I don't think they're relevant. I don't think I'm, I, I don't think I've anything on my sleeve. Okay, let's just. Wait, let's see. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you think I'm trying to trick you at the beginning, right. I don't think I am. If I am, I've tricked myself as well. Which could be. Let's see if I'm out of Yeah, okay. So you have the space space and you partition it. Okay, good. You chop it up into big regions, and each of these regions has a measure in terms of this measure on phase space, and when you can call that volume measure, call it omega. Um, there it is. And here, as everybody knows, is Boltzmann's grade. And sitting up here is S entropy equals minus K log. He has W. I'm not sure if they just, if somebody mistook a small omega for a large omega, or he used W, and they later used omega. I don't know. I, I couldn't, I didn't have time to track that down. Oh, well, Klein is actually the first one so to write that down, so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, I was asking the, the same question or the same remark that so where um, where did Boltzmann write this? He uh, never explicitly writes it like that. Find the first person to do it. Okay. Be but it, it, it's in essence. Who asked it to be put on his grave then? I don't know. Oh, who made the decision? You know, I, don't know. I, I thought he was. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. So in uh, 1906, and this was put on in 30s. In 30s, they oh, yeah. added it. Yeah. They added it in 30s, yeah. and uh, Big the, the yeah. person, first person who wrote this equation, he gave the name for the constant, which he never uh, wrote. This constant K is Boltzmann constant, right. but it was uh, Frank here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. Frank who wrote it, and it became through the work of Frank. This, uh, this became extremely important, and uh, it was written in Turkish. I, I think physicists proposed the family to, to 
So, so, so which which idea, which paper is closest to 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 this uh, formula? Because the one I I have in, in mind with the H theorem, and so it's just F L and F, which is. Uh, yeah, so um, you know, this, this procedure that Kim is, is going through where you chop, chop up the face space into volumes, and et, 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 et cetera, it, it's in a couple places, but it's in the lectures of ga on gas. OK. Yeah. OK. It, it, it's not the, that's not the first place it occurs, but it's in there. OK, gotcha. It's mm -hmm. most, yeah. So I mean, having, having corrected the historical inaccuracy and learned something, um, Anyway, this is a well-defined gadget, right? You've got s equals k log omega. No, of course, it's on the minus sign. Right? Do you want to say something? Well, omega gets big, s gets big. Um, do you want to say something about how how we go about making this partition in the water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah I, I, I exactly want to say something about that. So <laughs> that's exactly what I'm coming to. Uh, I'm just saying formally. As give me any partition defined however you like, I can then define an S rel rel relative to that partition, which is just this. And you say the entropy of your system is that for the member of the partition it happens to be in at any given moment. And as it wanders around through phase space, it can pass from one element of the partition to another. And as it does so, its entropy can increase or decrease, right? And formally, that's perfectly well defined, right? Uh, now, the question that Daniel raised is exactly right. I mean, I it, it is defined in such a liberal way. All I said was, give me a partition. I don't care which. And what I what you really should do, I think, to be clear, is subscript this s to. Partition, yes. right? Name the partition and say this is the S of this partition, this is the S of that partition. Right? And for each one you can think of, it will have its own entropy. Right? Which would make things much clearer. <laughs> it implies that there is some some um, nature of partition and the implicit, but it's not right. really true. Oh, you can, yeah. Right. But of course, one thing you can do. If you don't have to, is use these macroscopic thermodynamic parameters that we already talked about in classical thermodynamics to make the partition. Right. Now, they may only be applicable, it may be a kind of funny partition because there may be, again, transient states where you can't even assign it a temperature or something, right? But at least in some regions, there'll be a well-defined region where my box of gas has this temperature and this pressure, and another region where it has this temperature and this pressure. And Whenever the thing is in equilibrium and in one of these parts, there'll be a well-defined such Boltzmann entropy. And I would say the way you think of trying to have classical thermodynamics emerge from this is that you take the, what you already had accepted as the classical thermodynamic quantities, you use those to make the partition, and then you see how this Boltzmann entropy behaves, and you hope to show it's going to behave in epsilon the way the classical entropy behaves. Is that, I mean, that's, that's what I think the conceptual situation is. So, so at some point, uh, I feel like we should discuss the problems of generalizing Boltzmann's entropy to um, general relativistic systems. Mm -hmm. That's for Daniel. I mean, I don't how general relativity comes into this. Well, because th there are, I mean, there are problems that have been discussed by John Ehrman and other people with respect to you know, how you would define a measure on the general phase space of canonical variable relativity. And there are interesting I, I, problems. I, I have no objection to this topic. I have no knowledge of it. You know, so at some point, if somebody wants to talk about it. And you know, and we have some time. That's fine by me. I just, I know, literally zero complications that arise from trying to apply this in the general context. Above my head. Okay. Um, uh, uh, and here we import special theory of relativity. There was problems how to generalize thermodynamics. There were competing Tolman uh, and some other variations, and so it's, it's not. 
really the simplest to program. Okay. I'm, again, I don't know any of this stuff. Uh, just a, a, a very small comment on, on what you said about the relation to thermodynamics. Um, there's a slightly different, there's a more bottom-up way to think of it. Um, um, I mean, it's, it's very non-unique, and it would be hard to state uh, explicitly, but the intuition should be clear. You have the you have the phase space. You have the equations of motion. You feed all this into a computer, and you say, "Pick me a partition of the phase space which is nice, in the sense that um, it's made of blocks." That, that, as it were, evolve into each other according to some simple laws, okay? Or according to some simple yeah, within that statistic, so right, statistically, not, not perfect, no, 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 perfect. statistically reliable mm -hmm. laws. This is an example, you know, there would be lots of ways of partitioning up the phase space which aren't even going to remotely realize that this is right like that. Right. Of course, there will be lots that, that realize a bunch of desideratas like you know, biology, psychology, yeah. economics, so on and so forth. But here's a very, very simple one, very close to the very close to the ground, as it were. Okay? So it's not just that, it, 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 it's not just that um, the, the, way you, the way you said it might make it sound, might make the partition we use sound almost conventional right. from the standpoint of the underlying physics. And it's important that right. it's not. So, so to, uh, and let me try and just repeat what you said in slightly different words than you correct me if I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, if, if we associate this partition with a macro vocabulary, mm -hmm. and we want in that macro vocabulary to be things that look like laws, that to be right. reliable, exactly. you know, statistically reliable right. generalizations, right. then it better be right. that almost all the states that lie in this partition evolve over a period of time exactly. into exactly. that partition. Otherwise, they're just you know, right. random. It would exactly. describe, you know, exactly. macroscopically look and so, and this is just vis-a-vis -vis another caution. You will sometimes hear people say, in a way that strikes me as profoundly confused, that, um, that, that the partition we choose is highly conventional, is a highly conventional matter. That's not right, okay? There are features of the underlying dynamics such that, exactly as you said, certain partitions will, will give you a special sign, yeah, okay? so and others won't. So what happens if your computer wants to give this task to the computer? Yeah. The computer solves the Hamilton Jacobi equation yeah. and transforms everything into variables that are always constants of motion. And then your partition is a partition of things that never evolve. All your dynamics has gone because yeah, there is. So, so what? Well, wait, wait, is that a partition? It's an awful partition. But, 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 can, I, can I suggest, uh, David was suggesting, I think, one of many different right. desiderata. One right. desiderata is, of course, you would like the partition to correspond to properties that you can easily macroscopically identify. Right, right. That's another thing. Now, right. that, that also, I mean, I, I, right. I think... And that's part of what goes into calling it a special sign. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. And I, I, I mean, I should mention here that I think it, one ought to weaken a little bit what David says. So David said, well, you want this partition to evolve basically all of it into some part of another. It would also be, suppose I'm throwing dice. It's half the time, sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. then you have robust yeah, probability. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. it might be that the macro laws are probabilistic and exactly. still robust. Right. Exactly. And in answer to your question, it needs to be things that are easy to identify by sort of, you know, by, by ways that are related to, to our, our senses or various improvements on our senses okay. uh, or something like that. Right. <laughs> But we are coming into the picture is a very important thing. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. I think an interesting discussion related to this problem is Liouville theorem, which says if you go to microscopes in the description, the Hamiltonian equations, then you know that the, the, the uh, phase volume it does not change, which means we get directly from here that entropy is not changing. 
Suggestion. I, I can tell people are flagging, which makes sense. It's only 12:30, and I told you things go slowly here. I'm just gonna. I'm not flagging. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and, and, and I said we read about one. I told them about one. No, no, I'm kidding. Um, I'm flagging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna go through Goldsmith and get to the cusp of Gibbs, but not. I mean, Gibbs is gonna be a can of worms. So, uh, and I, I think I can finish this very quickly, and then we'll just break and we'll have lunch and go swimming, whatever. We can be okay. So just yeah. bear with me a little longer. Okay. Um, okay. It, 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 in, it, if the partition is of a form that there are these little, little tiny tiny regions, and then these much bigger regions, and then these much bigger, and maybe one huge region that's almost the whole of everything. Then, without even talking about what the dynamics is, if you just sort of model the dynamics as a random walk. You'd say, oh, well, if you start out in one of these little regions, which corresponds to low entropy, and just blind yourself and wander around, you're probably going to wander into a big region, and you're probably going to stay there a hell of a long time. And so there's this idea that, in a way, it's almost completely independent of the underlying dynamics. Just if the partition has the right shape, uh, a lot of at least the qualitative features of what we think of as you know, the, the laws of thermodynamics could kind of arise. Yeah. I'm really worried about, because I said this starts independent of the underlying dynamics, mm -hmm. what, and, and then continues, this is what we would expect the system to do. The, the dynamics is what the system would do. And I think you're implicitly um, assuming something that um, several people have already think, that, that this measure of God is conserved. Under the, under the, um, the, the, the measure that you're, you're, you're using is conserved. Not in what I just said. Not in what I just said. I mean, a random walk is not conserved. No reason to think it will be. But if I do a random walk and I got a little tiny region and it's surrounded by a huge big region, I'm kind of going to expect that pretty soon you're going to be in a big region and stay there for a while. Well, okay. If, I, if I've got to say a Markovian system and a random walk, there are going to be various measures on the space, and, but there will be but there'll be one. There will be a measure that is conserved under the um, random evolution, and um, yeah, for that measure, I would expect small things grow from small small to, to large. Not for other measures. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there's right. Right. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. But. You would expect there to be a wide variety of dynamics that would then Okay, but this is, you, you <laughs> asked us to, you you asked asked us to sound alarms when the natural was right. becoming pernicious. But I, okay, I, okay, maybe, uh, let me think, I mean, let me, uh, uh, over the break I'll think about okay. it. We can revisit it if, if necessary. Um, uh, and, and again, if one member dominates the others in volume, uh, then you call it equilibrium. It's kind of more or less the definition of the equilibrium state, just as the system will tend to stay in for a long time once it gets out. Uh, now, we go back to our color gaps. So, you can partition the phase space by the classical thermodynamic variables, uh, but nothing in Boltzmann, in the requirement, maybe not Boltzmann's definition, nothing in the definition of behavior requires that the partition have anything to do with the classical thermodynamic variables, we can use descriptions of the color of the gas perfectly well to find the molten entropy, right? And say, okay, these are the these are the states in which all the blue ones are on the right, all the red ones on the left, and these are the states in which about half are on the half of each are on the right and on the left. That's a perfectly way to put late partition. And by the usual combinatoric arguments, what we know is that the size of the phase space when about half it's half and half is much, 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 much bigger <laughs> than the, the size of the phase space where they're all blue here and all red there. Um, and so, by that definition, the red on the right and blue on the left is very low entropy, and the uniform purple is very high entropy. And when I remove the partition, it's going to evolve actually to progressively higher entropy states until it hits equilibrium. 
Um, and in this context, now remember, this is the same situation where we said thermodynamically that's a reversible process because when I put the partition back in, I get back to what was what is an equivalent thermodynamic state. But now it's not. Right now it's irreversible because I'm counting color as one of the relevant characteristics. And of course, you know, when I put the partition back in, I'm not back to my original state because now it's purple. <laughs> And all of this just follows from the definitions. You just have to be aware, OK, I've added this additional characteristic to the definitions, which is giving me a different partition, and now I'm getting a different behavior. Mm -hmm. It's all, I think, conceptually quite transparent. But there was supposed to be this big paradox about you know, the entropy of mixing and blah, blah, blah. And if they're identical particles, it's this, but they're not identical particles. And from a thermodynamic point of view, you still shrug. You say, thermodynamically, I don't care. Um, Okay, so here I'm going to stop. <laughs> okay, that was what I had to say about the Boltzmann entropy. It got us to that way of embedding these concepts in statistical mechanics. Gibbs did it a different way. And, you know, last year Wayne talked about this a bit. Wayne is more sympathetic to what Gibbs did than I am, to tell you the truth. And so I, I, I anticipate some fireworks. <laughs> So this is a good place to stop. If anybody has any final comments, if not, um, again, the, you know, the, the, the lunch thing, I told them of one, we can, we can just decompress for a while, and, uh, and now we'll eat. And, uh, just one quick thing, I, I, I lingered on, uh, on the first slide after the five page, when you just listed the five entropies, yeah. you mentioned the von Neumann entropy, and you yeah. said this is when we consider quantum statistical mechanics. Yeah. We lay on quantum. Or qu just plain quantum mechanics. Right. You don't have to be doing statistically. Right. But I was wondering why you left out quantum Boltzmann entropy, which is another alternative way of formulating the. I don't know anything about it. Okay. So, I mean, that might be another interesting. Sure. Aspect Somebody of wants to. I, as I said, I know there are lots of other defined entropies floating around. Uh, my grasp of how all this works in quantum oh, wait. mechanics is very. <laughs> I didn't, I, I, I'm not sure I've actually heard the phrase. Quantum Boltzmann. I haven't either. Yeah, but if somebody woke awesome. me up in the middle of the yeah. night and, and he asked me what that was, can we try that tonight? My, <laughs> my first guess would be, oh, it's it's just Boltzmann entropy, but where the measure on the state space is the quantum mechanical measure of dimensionality of the Hilbert space. Of the Hilbert space. Right. Yes. So is that That's what we're right. talking That's about? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but so say, you know, 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 know. That, that might be, I, maybe I'll even... Yeah. Hey, that that sure. Sure. But for instance, uh, Max Planck derivation, Max Planck derivation of uh, black body radiation was uh, quantum entropy. Using this definition, but dimensionality of the log of the it's, it's, it is, uh, you have uh, um, uh, photon gas yeah. in its application, that's the difference with respect to the classical gas. So systems could be quantum. And, and, the, and the distribution, I don't know what, what, what you are saying, but the case using both the ancient, uh, both the ancient distribution uh, 20 years before it puts in there. Well, that's not quite what I mean by No, I probably. I mean, right. this is a different, different yeah. thing. But then it, is not, it is not forbidden to apply uh, quantum distribution, quantum, uh, to apply Boltzmann. That, that's what he did. But so, you, were you raising that because you think the transition doesn't go as smoothly as I was just suggesting? Uh, well, you mean the transition from quantum Boltzmann yeah. to classical Boltzmann entropy? No, from or? classical Boltzmann entropy to quantum right. Boltzmann. Well, there are problems, yes, uh -huh. with the definition. I mean, it's very limited. It only works for systems that are, you know, uh, spanned by energy eigenstates. Hmm. And, um... Let's see, why, why, why is that? I mean, when, when I was... So, I, I, gave, well, this, so, I, I gave, so, gave this idea, I yeah. gave this one sentence account of what I would say if you woke me up in the middle of the night, and it was just that, yeah, you do the, you do yeah. the usual Boltzmann game, uh -huh. but now the measure on the, on the space of states is this dimensional measure mm -hmm. on, on Hilbert space rather than a volume measure in, in a phase space. Right. So I didn't say anything mm -hmm. there about energy in particular, or, right. or is there some reason why, why that, gets, that doesn't work? Yes, it seems to be related to uh, the system, the Hilbert space of the system having to be finite dimensional. 
and the ballots. Why? Yeah, I, is, so, is this a matter so, of making it mathematically tractable, or, or I mean, not, not that yeah. that's not a significant matter, but yeah. uh, if you but, take the log of the dimension and that's the log of a finite number, right? Um, no, 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 no. The dimension of a subspace. Oh, I see. The dimension of a subspace. Yeah, yeah, has to be. Has to be. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about this. Okay. I think and, Planck was exactly confronted with the problem of. Uh, changing from continuous variable to discrete variable. Yes, yeah. And so uh, that was a bit there where H right, right, right. the, 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 the uh, quantification of energy appeared. Yeah, I see because uh, there was a problem with the distribution distribution right. role. Right, right. I see what you're saying. So in the in the the idea is that in the classical case, the physically natural examples are transparently going to be associated with finite volumes. Mm -hmm. And in the quantum mechanical case, the physically natural examples are certainly not transparently going to be associated with finite dimensional substances. Is that? I'm not sure I understand. Okay, okay. I, uh, let me just yeah. say, yeah. even if you guys could agree you understand each other, I don't. I mean, you, <laughs> yeah. I mean you're going okay. very fast. Yeah. I mean, so we should talk about this. It's good, okay. good. Uh, I would so, like to hear this from the historical perspective. So. Oh, okay. Good. But we'll put it on the agenda. Um, back to the agenda. I never know. Should I use Max or Monoly? I, now you've got me. Whatever you want. I use both names. What, whatever whatever you're more comfortable with. Be <laughs> <laughs> liberal about it. He's more mean? comfortable with the, with the correct one. Yeah. <laughs> I guess subject to that, okay, I, I guess I prefer Monoly, but okay. it's, well, but it's, it's okay in Max or That's fine. Yeah. 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 Just, just, you know, it, it's your, your job to keep track, and at a certain point, you suggest again in case I forget that this is a topic. You know, uh, good. That, that would be worthwhile. Uh, so I, I will make the suggestion of open to emendation that we reconvene at four and Great. sort of think about doing another two and a half hours. Great. Right about from now until four to eat. Great. If you want to get down to the sea, right. you can just follow these steps down and then go left if you want to get to the little. Beach where there's gravel. If you just prefer, you can go out on the rocks and you all have to do the swimming. Blah blah blah. Um, how does that sound? Sounds great. All right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.